Hi, welcome to The Issue on the ASGCT Podcast Network. I'm your host, Emily Walsh-Martin, and today I'm joined by Derek Jackson, the Vice President of Cell and Gene Therapy Product Development at Pacera. Now, often on this show, we discuss the development of gene and cell therapies for rare diseases, where usually the teams of scientists working on the program don't have any personal experience with the disease from their family or their friends or themselves. But today we're gonna talk about the development of a gene therapy for a much more common disease where many of us either know someone or our cells have experience, osteoarthritis of the knee. Moreover, the product we will be discussing is not only non-rare, but also non-AAV. I hope you enjoy this episode. But before we get started, It's hard to believe we're already to this point in the year, but abstract submission for the 2025 ASGCT annual meeting opens on November 11th. You'll wanna get going now to ensure that your abstract can be included next May, as we'll all be getting together in New Orleans next year. And I will personally hand out gold stars to folks who are submitting long-term follow-up from their clinical data. Love to see more, much more four-year, six-year, 10-year follow-up from the studies that started decades ago. So if you want an extra gold star from yours truly, I'm happy to provide one for long-term follow-up clinical data. And now on to the episode. Welcome to the issue on the ASGCT podcast network. Derek Jackson, (laughs) Vice President of uh, Cell and Gene Therapy Product Development at Pacera. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. It is great to be with you, Emily. You're, as you know, one of my favorite people. (laughs) (laughs) No, this is is fantastic because today we're going to talk about something uh, different than usual. We're going to talk about developing gene therapies for non-rare diseases. And also, we're going to be talking about using non-AAV vectors. But before we dive into that science, um, can you share a little bit about your career path? Because I think our audience is always interested in how people uh, uh, sort of find their way through this industry to to their uh, ultimate careers. Yeah, I I feel like my uh, career path makes me a perfect representative of uh, non-traditional approaches in gene therapy because my career path is non-traditional. I, you know, I, as you know, I started off as a small molecule person. Uh, my academically, I'm a synthetic organometallic chemist, and uh, not a lot of jobs in those. So when I when I started working in pharma way back in the mid 1990s, uh, I wended my way through a variety of small and very large, uh, in fact, the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. Uh, working in analytical and and branching out into drug delivery systems and understanding how those systems interact with the body to release their payloads, Uh, eventually moving to the Boston area and uh, found my way into the osteoarthritis field where I've spent the last 20 years of my life um, primarily working on novel drug delivery systems for osteoarthritis. And wouldn't you know it, I think of our gene therapy as a novel drug delivery system for osteoarthritis and and maybe not like a traditional gene therapy. Absolutely. No, I I that resonates with me. And you know, full disclosure, um Derek, I think it's important for us to say that I've I've worked with you uh quite a bit. Um, both um, when this program uh, that we're going to talk about today was at Flexion, its uh, original sort of landing spot, and then also at Pacera. Um, and while I'm on my sabbatical now sailing the world, I was part of the team at Pacera and honored to be able to present uh, some of your clinical data at the last ASGCT meeting. But for folks who missed that presentation or are unfamiliar with Pacera's uh, product, PCRX201, uh, can you give folks the sort of big picture of uh, the therapeutic concept b- behind this product? Yeah, so uh, PCRX201 is a high-capacity adenovirus. It encodes for human interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, a potent anti-inflammatory endogenous protein, 
And uh, we interestingly have a construct that is under inflammation inducible uh, protein expression. So we use an NF kappa B uh, expressible promoter. And um, that really allows 201 to, to function kind of as, as a mimic of the natural uh, physiologic response to, to inflammation. So, you know, some of the things that we, we like about HCAD and why we selected HCAD, because uh, at the time that Flexion was doing due diligence, we, we did explore multiple opportunities in this space. Um, we like HCAD because it's an adenovirus, and we believe that that faster and more efficient transduction uh, that, that adenoviruses could have uh, compared to AAVs uh, could offer us opportunities in lower doses uh, and, and as well as some other uh, interesting biology that, that we're continuing to explore that maybe I don't discuss here and now, but um, you know th those those aspects made it an attractive option for us. Uh, primarily, you know, we're very much focused on cost of goods and how much how, how many doses can you make from a single batch. So, you know, some of those factors can we dose lower with adenovirus compared to AAV? Those really factored into our decisions. And and it's important to say that when we're talking about dosing lower. Um, we're really talking about dosing lower with this product because the way, uh, so the, the the indication that it's currently being developed for is osteoarthritis of the knee, um, and it's being injected locally into the knee. Um, and so that, uh, I think, is, is sets this product apart from a lot of the gene therapy development that's done in this field where we're trying to get systemic um, uh, uh, transduction uh, of, you know, an entire body or something like that you're you're really trying to focus locally and um and obviously what's what's interesting is uh and you you already sort of talked about this you know you you were there at flexion when the team was you know thinking about the diligence on this product and it was before ind enabling tuck studies had been done um and so i'd love to hear uh you know a bit of color about you know for a larger company at that time, you know, Flexion, um, looking at, you know, the the wares, the products from a smaller company um, yeah. and not having all the T's dotted or all the T's crossed and I's dotted. Like, how did you guys think about this product and and where the risks were? And, and uh, I would love to hear how the team sort of did their diligence. It's interesting you ask that because... Um... Just this weekend, I was talking with Adam Musicant, who you probably remember from Flexion. He was he was leading the BD effort, and uh, he was this this program has a series of champions throughout its lifetime so far. And Adam, to me, was the original industry champion for this. And uh, it, you know, we we were exploring how to expand the portfolio of Flexion now that we had this newly approved product, uh, Zoretta, which is a sustained release steroid. So, you know, uh, innovative in its space, but not a, you know, fundamental innovation because it was extending the release of an existing therapy. So uh, someone actually knocked on our door, not related to 201, but rather an AAV product uh, that also expressed IL-1RA. And this really sparked some interest with Adam, uh, but he was kind of the lone ranger at that point, uh, because I think he went in and, and as he told me this weekend, he yeah, went into our CEO's office and kind of laid out this concept of, hey, what do you think, what would you think if we had a long acting IL-1RA uh, where we deliver the genes to your to your to the cells of your knee and they express them whenever inflammation starts to occur to knock down and quell inflammation and it can address pain and possibly even disease modification. Oh, and by the way, we deliver it using a virus. Uh, and I think the the CEO's initial reaction was, get the heck out of my office. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so so the, the diligence really started with that question and with the mm. pushback from, from the CEO. And uh, so to hear Adam's story, um, gosh, it's amazing that he, he told me this just this weekend because I, I don't know that I knew all the details. Uh, but to hear Adam's story, from that point, it just started, you know, investigate this scientifically, go into the literature, talk to the people that are doing the research, and and get a deeper understanding of what are the strengths and weaknesses of this opportunity. And in the process of doing that, we discovered 
this interesting project that was being spun out of Baylor College of Medicine and uh, was mm-hmm. being led by Killian Gusa, who is the CEO of GQ Bio now. And um, so we started to compare and contrast these assets. And you know, one of the great things about Adam is, yes, he's a business development guy, but he's also a very brilliant scientist with with some significant scientific chops. So he was able to pull the right voices into the conversation, lay out the scouting work for what's interesting. And then the process of, of due diligence is basically, how can we kill this, right? What What is the weakest spots? And we're going to poke on those until the more you poke, the stronger it seems. And really, we landed on 201 because we liked the inducible promoter that really resonated with us. So rather than constantly expressing IL-1RA, um, you know, what are the risks of constantly expressing it? So we like the notion of mimicking the body's natural response, having it turn on and off when it was needed. On demand, I think, is the is the catchphrase that we like to use in the early days. And uh, from there, it was building internal support for the program, making sure the CMC team saw a path forward, making sure the clinical and the non-clinical team understood what would be required to get us into human study, getting regulatory buy-in. I mean, these were all new disciplines from a gene therapy perspective uh, for for flexion at the time, and and finding the right consultant network, which is how you and I eventually uh, got introduced. So, you know, what we didn't need was help in the disease space. We were already Mm. expert in long-acting osteoarthritis drugs, and local delivery was really our our focus. Um, And we saw the local delivery play here as a real opportunity to unlock the potential of gene therapy for a broad prevalent disease market. Uh, And, you know, I can can carry that story story forward from the due diligence we did when we acquired the asset from Baylor and GQ Bio to that program surviving an acquisition by a company, Pasira, where I'm currently an employee. Uh, and and now that asset has found its place kind of at the at the fore of what we see as a pivot into innovative medicine. Uh, you know, Pasira, like Flexion, had sustained release products for pain. And, um, you know, I think what it takes to to deliver a gene therapy into common disease, prevalent disease, is a deep understanding of the disease, the customers, the patients, and, and how products need to fit into that market space in order for them to become successful. You know, with, with rare disease, your customer base is there already, and, uh, and they're waiting. They're, they're, they, they need these therapies. For uh, diseases like osteoarthritis, well, there are a lot of options out there, but none of them are great, and, and none of them to date really change the trajectory of the progression of osteoarthritis disease. So cycling back to your original question, those kinds of questions, we already kind of understood how a product like this could fit in. Really, the biggest part of the due diligence was building the right team and the right support network to make sure that the staff we had could grow and this product could be a, a good fit for the company. And you know, as, as you know, through the various years on and off that you've worked with us on this, uh, we've been able to do that. And, and I'm really proud to say that, you know, we, we're nearing the end of our phase one studies and and looking forward to the next set of studies, whether they be a phase 1B or a phase two. Uh, we're in the process of working that out right now with the FDA, which, by the way, as you know, uh, we're doing that under the auspices of an RMAT designation, which is fantastic. And again, I think that harkens back to the importance of the clinical team at Flexion understanding that this is a prevalent disease. It's a disease Mm. that is primarily measured by patient reported outcomes. That's unique in the space. So unlike many gene therapies where you can kind of prove the concept at fundamentally a molecular level, (laughs) here we needed to really study it in a large enough population that we could understand not only how it affects disease progression and some of these other, you know, more detailed biological processes, but fundamentally, how does it affect the most important thing that osteoarthritis patients are concerned about? And that's pain and function. So with that large phase one population, we were able to demonstrate with very good data to the FDA that this is an interesting and important opportunity in the OA space. Sorry, I went a little bit afield from the original. No. It all starts to flow once you get talking about it. <laughs> 
you know, well, osteoarthritis abs- for me. Exactly. And and I think the important thing maybe for, for this audience to understand, although maybe some of our audience actually does, like that's the one distinction, right, of, of, of working on a, a more common disease like osteoarthritis of the knee. Um, typically, you know, the, the programs that I've worked on that have been in the rare space, I usually don't know anyone who has that disorder. I, 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 it's very seldom that like that indication has touched my, my friends, my family, or my extended network in any way. Um, with osteoarthritis of the knee, um, many of us are either current <laughs> customers or future customers. Um, and, and that includes people who are on the team. And I think what is, what is good about that is, is it, it, you know, increase creates passion, right? Uh, from the team because we know, uh, you know, we're doing something that might even benefit ourselves one day. Um, but, but as well, I think, um, I, I think it uh, helps to contextualize, you know, what the big hurdles are going to be, especially in clinical development for something like this. And and you already mentioned this, but like for osteoarthritis of the knee, you know, many of the endpoints are. Are patient reported, and that's that's because um, there's this weird thing where you know the structure of the knee um, and and maybe how much cartilage you have left doesn't necessarily correlate with your experience of the disease, and so it's it's a complicated uh, indication from from that perspective. Um, uh, and love love to hear you know your thoughts on that and and how that sort of comes to bear as you think about clinical development a bit. Oh yeah, that's that's it's such a crucial point. Um, you know. For us, the real promise and what what drove the early enthusiasm as we started to generate the non-clinical data is that when you're looking at a histological level uh, in in animal studies, we see a a meaningful impact on 201's ability to prevent the development of osteoarthritis in these osteoarthritis models in animals. And you can very readily correlate that to uh, 201 being able to slow or halt the progression of bone shape changes and and commensurate loss of cartilage. Uh, but as you say, these these are these are biological endpoints that are very slow to develop. Uh, they develop quickly in animals because their metabolic rate is so much faster. Uh, but they develop very slowly in patients. And when you're starting in patients that are already diseased, measuring these changes from a baseline that is not zero, right? A, base, yeah. a baseline that is already somewhat biologically complicated uh, is a challenge. So what ultimately drives patient behavior? I mean, I don't think anybody with OA shows up at a doctor's office going, you know, I feel fine, but my my bone feels like it might be misshapen a little bit, or I, I've lost some cartilage, <laughs> I'm losing sleep over it. That That's not what drives patient behavior. So we know that pain and function, like your ability to just do your activities of daily living. And, and you know, those, those are the things that drive patient need and unmet medical need. And from a regenerative medicine standpoint, if we can layer into that also the ability to stay ahead of the disease. So one of the problems in osteoarthritis, in my opinion, this is uh, my personal opinion after doing research in the space for so long, is when you're treating the symptoms, the problem is if you don't treat the underlying cause of the disease, eventually the disease will begin to outpace your ability to treat the symptoms. Mm. So what I see is the great promise in 201, and this is what we hope to prove uh, over the coming years in our phase two and three clinical studies, is that not only are we addressing the, the symptoms, the pain and function, but we're slowing the progression so that we're matching that and, and able to give patients a significant improvement in in quality of life, a long and durable response, which is a very attractive concept. Now, translating that clinically, it creates some challenges for us, namely timelines. Right? If you're <laughs> if you're if you're trying to get approved for a one year lasting product or a two year lasting product, those clinical trials are sometimes difficult to fathom. And, uh, you know, even in the shorter acting steroid space where I used to work, uh, just a 12-week endpoint was often <laughs> a challenge to smaller organizations. So, you know, that it, it creates some interesting conversations uh, around how do you pace this program? What risks are you willing to take? 
what risk can you take when it's a prevalent disease and not a rare disease? You know, um, mm -hmm. that's why the RMAT designation was so critical. I, I don't know that uh, I don't RMAT doesn't accelerate your clinical timelines, but what it does do is it accelerates your conversations with the FDA. So you can really get more touch points and and build a, a better clinical plan. Uh, it, it, to me, that's what I see as the great promise of RMAT for something like an osteoarthritis drug. So that we know as we embark on these one to two year studies per phase, uh, that we're doing the right things from the beginning. And, you know, layering into that the importance of collaborating with groups that you wouldn't normally collaborate with in early development. So, you know, if when when you start a program like this, you're committing to the long term. You really need to believe not only in the biology and the and the clinical aspects of the program, but that the stories you will be able to tell by the time you get to the market in seven or eight years, uh, that you know those those stories line up with with where this product belongs in the marketplace. So Unlike most programs I've worked on in my career that are in phase one, uh, I meet with the uh, you know commercial marketing, healthcare economic out, uh, outcomes research, and uh, and you know just the the teams that are more on that late development commercial focus because we really need to build the boat perfectly before we sail it into into phase two and three, right? Right. Yeah. No. It's it it's definitely. It's it it's like it's a double edged uh, uh, sort of opportunity. Like on the one hand, uh, you know these clinical trials are larger, right? So your your phase one trial enrolled seventy two adult uh, patients with uh, osteoarthritis of the knee. Yeah. So those are the kinds of numbers that in a rare disorder might be the entire BLA package, if we're being right. honest, right? <laughs> right. Um, it's it's it, and that's just your phase one, and and. You know, obviously, you know, your phase two, uh, one expects will uh, continue to add to those numbers. And and what's what's interesting is um, that's a huge uh, sort of wealth of patient experience. And so to your point about, you know, wanting to talk to uh, health economics and outcomes research or HEOR uh, as the acronym goes, like you want to talk to them early because if there's something small, you can add to the design of the trial that's going to get you data that not just satisfies, you know, clinical outputs, but also maybe satisfies these uh, economic outputs that, that you're going to need to leverage later in uh, development. Like it's now's the time, right? Yeah. Because because then then you're going to have uh, a more robust clinical trial that gives you uh, you know the full view of what you need all the way to uh, to the end there. Absolutely, and you know, just to layer on, you know, I, I, we could probably talk for hours on the complexities that are that are introduced when working in prevalent disease, but you know, not uncommon to have a antibody screen. Prior to dosing, with uh, with many gene therapies that are out there, in in prevalent disease, uh, that's a huge barrier to entry. So again, that that's another aspect that we think we like about adenovirus compared to AAV is that you know the transduction efficiency and the kinetics of transduction with adenovirus may enable us to um, to to avoid uh, having that be a necessity. And one of the nice things about large studies is that you can tease a lot of information out of them. And so as, as you know, and as, as we've discussed publicly, um, you know, we, we had patients with baseline neutralizing antibodies to our vector uh, at, at baseline because, you know, our, our adenovirus is uh, fundamentally an adenovirus that's in the community. So, um, you know, when we find those kinds of data in our 72 patient studies, uh, it, it it really helps form our opinion and, and, and it kind of proves the hypotheses that we were thinking were true at the very beginning of this when we were doing our due diligence and saying, aha, you know, we, we, you know, we were able to tease that data out. When you're looking at, you know, five patients and they right. have very clear biomarkers, uh, and you're looking for one protein or enzyme. Uh, it's 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 a very nice, tidy, linear package. And and honestly, I think gene therapy could have never started in a prevalent disease. I think you had mm. to prove the concept and the value of gene therapy the way that we have done it as an industry. And I, I just I do feel that now is the right time for us to to carry it forward and and apply it more broadly. And I think you know we stand on the shoulders of giants and. Everything I know about gene therapy, I, I like to say I learned from you and from a few uh, well attended <laughs> ASGCT conferences and training sessions that that I, I did early in my uh, 
in my transition into the gene therapy world from the small molecule world. So, you know, th those things that we've learned, um, it's, if you're paying attention, you can really start to look at your clinical data, look at your designs and say, yeah, if we if we add these elements or if we look for these elements, uh, we'll be able to understand how we position ourselves uh, for this disease as well as, you know, for gene therapies in general. Absolutely. Well, and I think, uh, you know, I think that's a, a, another thing to point out, you know, uh, and we've talked about this on on the issue in the past, you know, in a lot of ways, the initial, you know, forays, especially with the AAVs um, into gene therapy, really tried to hone in on uh, indications where um, proving the you know, not only the functionality of the vector, but as well the clinical benefit, we're almost synonymous in the same endpoint. And so for that, I'm thinking about hemophilia, right? Like if you know how much factor your your vector is producing, then you, you really have an appreciation for uh, whether or not you're going to move the needle clinically. And one of the things that, you know, you mentioned at the top uh, with PCRX201 that's absolutely a benefit uh, is, is that it's got this inducible promoter which means if you need it, it's on. If 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 the inflammation is currently quelled in your knee, then, then it's not going to be expressing. But that also creates some complications for actually looking uh, at uh, how it's working in the clinic, right? And <laughs> so <laughs> how, how is that, um, you know, how are you thinking about that uh, long-term? What, what, um, you know, it's it's not going to be the same sort of stories hemophilia where you can say, okay, the the factor is there, and you know, I know I created this much factor with this much virus. Um, it's it's a little different. Absolutely, and and add into that the complexity that the protein we express is identical to the endogenous human IL1RA. So I can't even differentiate it with a right. you know, with a fancy assay on the back end. So And obviously um, that was a good good call, right? Because if it's identical, it does mean, you know, it's unlikely to be a neoepitope, right? For, exactly. for the body and 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 run into problems there. So like all of the aspects of this product make it it was super intentional but but also means it's it's a little complicated <laughs> yeah and, you know, so uh, i'll try to answer that on a couple of levels i mean the first level is you have to help people understand your story because mm. all of a sudden we're not talking about standard you know pkpd relationships and you know we're talking about patient reported outcomes and uh, explaining your data to people that expect a strong dose response. Um, th those, those, I've, I've gotten much better at that <laughs> in the last couple right. of years of my career because it, those are generally pretty easy stories to tell in small molecule land and and even in uh, you know enzyme replacement land. But uh, here, uh, you know, we we need to. I fundamentally the the ideal experiment for a construct like ours that's inducibly expressed so you're not seeing you know levels that can be constantly measured and differentiated uh, would be to harvest tissue uh, and just show that you continue to have you know duration of your transgene and um mm -hmm. and and perhaps do some in vitro experiments with patient tissues uh, that's something that's ahead of us. Uh, I think it's an important element for us to address uh, as 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 the program progresses. But at the same time, accessing those tissues, uh, you know, will how many patients will go on to a total knee replacement, and and would we have an opportunity to gather the tissues there? Doing tissue biopsies of of the synovium in an OA patient is not trivial, uh, mm -hmm. as I come to understand and appreciate. And when your primary outcome is patient reported and you potentially are inducing additional pain with these, you know, intraoperative or intra-articular procedures, um, it, it, it becomes very complicated. So I, I wish I had a, a perfect answer for you, uh, but right. I think we just have to collect the data uh, and these are going to be fairly large studies. And uh, in those data, continue to look for things like do we see a loss of durability based on dose as opposed to, you know, an effect based on dose? And I think that's an easy story to tell. Um, and, you know, but it, it requires a lot of time. <laughs> and, right. Uh, yeah. So it, it is. It and, is and that's time. It, exactly. And that's time you guys um, are, are coming up on. Right. If I remember correctly, uh, the two year data is is meant to come out. Is it November or 
Yes, we present our two-year data at uh, ACR, the American College of Rheumatology Conference in DC. And I think that date is November, it's Sunday, November 17th. And uh, right. it's being presented by one of our investigators and a former president of ACR, uh, Dr. Stanley Cohen. So we're very excited to see those data published and out in the public domain. I think the world has already uh, seen the 52-week data that you got to present last year uh, at, at ORSI and ASGCT. So, uh, you know, we, we and, and, you know, as you know, patients are followed for the long term on these studies. So uh, right. three-year patients are coming up uh, in, in a few months, and we'll start to work with that data. So, it, you know, every every November when we hit our last patient end date from uh, three years ago, it's like Christmas call, starting all over again. We get to unbox a lot of new data and and see where this program, uh, you know, what, what kind of true durability it can achieve. And I don't know that three-year durability is, is necessary for a successful product. So again, we have to start balancing uh, mm-hmm. From commercial and you know uh, insurance and regulatory and patient value story, you know what is the most important data point for us to have in our label to get this out into the public as quickly as as we can, so that patients can begin to benefit from it on a on a broad basis, uh, but still you know making sure that we're collecting long term data so that people can understand the true promise of of a product like this. Absolutely. So I, I do kind of want to change directions because often on on the issue, we talk uh, a lot about the science. We talk about, uh, you know, challenges of development, but we also talk about, um, you know, I guess the art of developing these products and what that means from a team perspective. And, you know, recently, um, like you've taken on the role of program lead um, for PCRX201. Um, obviously, your your background in chemistry, manufacturing, and controls, CMC, um, uh, is an important part of probably what you bring to the table there in, in the program lead role. But I'm curious, um, you know, you've been in the role now for a few months. Like, what are you finding about uh, the challenges of the role? How, how are you finding the change from being a sort of a functional lead to a integrated lead um, on, on this program? It's a, it's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I will jokingly say I might be, if, if you interviewed people that worked with me in the past, either their favorite or least favorite colleague, because <laughs> I love to get in other people's shops. That's just part of who I am. Um, you know, I, I love what I do and I love what you do as well. And I, I want to understand it. So, from that perspective, I have really enjoyed taking on a, a broader remit uh, in terms of leading the interdisciplinary team. And, you know, having worked in drug development for 25, 26 years uh, <laughs> or no longer, almost 30 now, um, you know, I, I'm able to to bring to bear quite a bit of experience in terms of how groups interact and 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 so forth. But What I've really enjoyed, and I think I hinted on this earlier, is because we're investing so much into this program and and making sure that it is designed with the end in mind uh, as we as we initiate each clinical trial, uh, which, by the way, everybody should do all the time, but we don't always have that luxury. Um, You know, getting to know the functions that I didn't used to interact with as much has been Mm -hmm. just just super invigorating. I mean, I, I can't even, I can't, I can't put a better term to it than that because I feel for the first time in my long career uh, that I am, I'm not just a scientific drug developer. I, I feel uh, that you know by interacting with with these broader groups um, and and really understanding how how the development cycle on an innovative product works, uh, you know what kinds of unknown questions. That I've always found interesting scientifically. Well, actually, I find the unknown questions commercially and in terms of uh, you know product access, uh, those unknown questions are just as complicated. And so I have a much deeper appreciation uh, for all of the disciplines involved in drug development. And it's it's kind of refreshing to take off my CMC hat, which I still put on at, at the end of every meeting because I have to go back to that deliverable, uh, and, and to Put the hat on that priority, you know, that that sets priorities based on other people's concerns. So, um, in a selfish way, 
this role has made me a better CMC scientist because I now have a deeper understanding and appreciation for everything that goes into establishing a timeline, everything that Mm. goes into what each group matter, you know, what matters to each group. Um, You know, and, and I went from long ago in my career being analytical to analytical and formulation to analytical formulation process development. You know, I've, I've, I've kept adding different disciplines but they were always under the umbrella of CMC. After the acquisition of Flexion by Pacera, I also took on uh, non-clinical and basically all of the scientific functions of the gene therapy, uh, thanks in large part to you and the Flexion team that educated me on that over you know, the last two or three years that we were working on that together. Um, and so you know, that was, that was exciting. But again, I think for me, seeing the full drug development spectrum and the fact that we're all engaged from the beginning together uh, has has really been the most rewarding thing I've done in my career, uh, and it's uh, it's it's a very nice way to um, to kind of move forward in the next step because there you know you get to the point where gosh I've done CMC forever, uh, what's new? Okay, gene therapy is new, so we'll we'll add that. But but this is really a vast expansion of of how I think about drug development. Yeah, no, I, uh, what something you said totally resonated with me. It's it's that it, it, you you sort of get that aha moment when you realize, oh, the reason, you know, I can't spend, you know, this money over here right now is cuz we still have these other risks in this other department first that we mm-hmm. need to clear clear first because it doesn't necessarily make sense to spend over here without f- sorting this out first and being able to see how that big puzzle fits together i i think does um it, like you you sort of said made made you a better cmc person oftentimes made me you know better at whatever functional aspects i was trying to uh um, help carry. Um, but it, it does change your perspective. Um, uh, once you, once you're not accountable just for, uh, the function, but, but in how that all knits together. Yeah. I, you know, I had this, uh, funny tagline from early in my career, a colleague and I were working at the bench and doing something together. And, uh, I, I I looked at him and I said, "Together we are clever." And he he joking he looked back at me and he said, "But apart we are not smart." And it uh, <laughs> that, that has stuck with me forever because I truly believe in the team ethic. And I, I you know I've listened to the podcast for for some time now, and I love that you always describe this as a team sport. And I can say you know you could have the most brilliant scientist in the world on your project, but if you're not doing this as a team, you're mm-hmm. going to fail the project. And you're going to fail patience in the end. And so, uh, you know, we we have to be willing to be vulnerable, share our strengths and weaknesses, uh, share where deliverables might be getting soft. <laughs> and, and so that the full team knows how we're doing this and that we're doing it together. Um, I'm, I'm cheesy. I enjoy lots of slogans and sayings and, and proverbs. And uh, there's a old African proverb that that resonates with me every day. You know, it's uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. And that's really how I look at 201. 201, it, it can't be done fast. And we have to make sure that this program goes as far as possible so that we have a real transformational impact on patient lives. And uh, the fact that we're doing this as a very highly integrated team is, mm-hmm. uh, as I said before, it's the most rewarding thing I've done in my career. Well, and, and it sounds like, too, and this, you know, this warms my heart to hear because, um, you know, it's certainly when you when you hear someone from CBER talk about the RMAP program, one of the things they try to say is, let, let us partner with you. Yeah, And you hear that a lot. And, and it sounds like, you know, um, now that you guys are in it and experiencing the RMAT um, experience, that that's also true. So so it's not just inside of your company that that's part of your team, but as well now you've got, you know, uh, partners and team members sort of uh, at CBER uh, via the RMAT um, uh, designation. Absolutely. That's, uh, we recently had a meeting with, with CBER and, it was, you know, I've, I've been in a lot of these over over my career, and uh, m- mostly with Cedar. Uh, Cedar is a bit of a different beast, anyway, uh, and in terms of how they interact with with companies. But the RMAT designation is it is 
it is just magic. I mean, it is very much Sieber saying to us, hey, let, let, let's let's do this together, right? And yeah. I think we offer some interesting opportunities. I mean, we are talking about prevalent disease. We're talking about understanding how do you balance risks with the ability to progress programs in a in a viable way, right? Uh, so, you know, the, these we're going to be charting some new territory uh, with with the FDA, and and I'm happy that this is a give and take. You know, we're not yeah we're not just sending them finished product and saying, do you agree or not agree? We're saying, hey, here's some of the things we're thinking about, or some of the opportunities that we see. How should we assess the risk from your perspective? Uh, versus, you know, how we're already assessing it. And we've already gotten some tremendous feedback uh, and, and you know, feedback that's going to help help us do this right the first time. And I, and I can't emphasize that enough. There's so few opportunities to start over <laughs> on, on right. our timeline because of the, the long duration uh, that we have to do this right from the first time. And, and I think RMAC gives us that. Uh, the, the FDA has been a very open collaborator with us so far. That's great to hear. All right, we're at the end of our time, but I get to ask my favorite final question, which is if you could wave a magic wand and fix one thing for cell and gene therapy development, what would it be? And, uh, you know, full disclosure, I know you've listened to the podcast, Derek, so you've probably heard to say the ability to overlabel minus 80 degree vials and or global harmonization of label requirements is mine. So you can't steal that one. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> what would your what would yours be? <laughs> I'm afraid it's not going to be terribly original when I think about what others have responded. Um, but I'll give you a longer answer here. Sorry. So I grew up a small molecule guy, and in small molecules, you can crystallize your final drug substance so that you always have Ooh. the same thing, the same purity, the same crystalline form at the end of your drug substance process, no matter how you got there, right? And so. If we, if I had a wand, I would love to create a similar process for uh, process development of viral vectors because you know it, it is a challenge. Comparability drives a lot of what I'm doing is I'm trying to uh, develop our commercializable process for PCRX201. So if we could do something like that, that would allow us to have this consolidated standard uh, in our process, it would allow us to start doing fit for purpose development as opposed to heavy upfront investment to make sure that mm. you've got the right process before you really get into your pivotal studies pharma in the small molecule world doesn't have to do that and uh and it's a it, it makes cmc very complex it impacts clinical timelines because clinical is waiting <laughs> for the right. right material to start their pivotal study or it impacts regulatory because you're having to take huge risks uh and and with no guaranteed outcome. So that's my magic wand wish. It's always about manufacturing, isn't it, Emily? I love that though. That's that's fantastic. And um man, I wish that for us. Like some you know, basically to have sort of a true north. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> the ability to have a true north that you can guide to while you, you know, change your scale or improve your process. I love that. Um Derek Jackson Thank you so, so much for joining us on the issue. Really appreciate you taking the time. This has been so much fun to talk about. Um, and um, I'm very excited for you guys uh, next month uh, to, to present your two-year data. And uh, uh, best of luck as you continue uh, to develop ECRX 201. Thank you so much, Emily. My pleasure. <laughs>